one of the interesting um, concepts that has emerged is that we now have an official art in America, much like uh, the salon, the 19th century salon. I mean, think of this parallel, and you've been probably well read in the arts, um, and aware of our history. If you think back to the 1880s when the French Impressionists abandoned the officially sanctioned art of their day, the salon, and they protested what they called the, the morgue, which they called the Louvre, the Louvre Museum of the Morgue, that this is where dead paintings by dead artists were. And they said, we want to take art back out of the darkness of the, of the morgue and bring it to the people. And they formed the Salon des Refusés. And through their own exhibit, I mean, Art History 101, you look back on that, hey, that was a landmark. The Impressionists, you know, did something different. Well, here we are 100 years later, and we have um, an officially sanctioned art that the NEA and the um, critical establishment has endorsed. And it does not include artists like myself who are populist artists. Um, so, there's probably a group of artists like myself who are real artists, dedicated with passion to what they create, who think it's time to at least let the alternative be visible. That this is populist art, it is what it is, it's iconographic art. It is not art embraced by the critical elite, and a great act of bravery, and in a way def cultural defiance, um, is in process with this exhibit. It's kind of like a salon de refusé <laughs> for our day in a way. Because this is the first time I've been approached by a museum saying, hey, we're going to enshrine the art and treat it with a degree of respect that we would afford to the more experimental art that we normally show. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that was the reason when they uh, asked me if I would do this show, uh, that was the reason I did it, because I knew that it was going to create dialogue, I, I knew that it was going to create excitement, it was something that normally is never done. So those are the kind of things that I'm uh, attracted to. Something happened at the age of 22? Yeah, was, that was the, the, the explosion of my personal faith. That was when I made a conversion in my heart to personal faith in God. Before um, that, I was somewhat atheistic and agnostic and cynical. Christian, can you be, can you be specific? Yeah, when I was about 22 years old, I went to a faith revival meeting and uh, with a Bible-believing Christian church. And uh, yeah, my faith has grown from that point. And I always think of the analogies we see in scriptures of light. And in the Christian faith, there's much description of light. And Christ talked of that we are a light on a hill and to let our light shine before the world. And that analogy, I think, infused me in some way, and I think the light went on in my life, but also in my art. One of the things that was mentioned in some of the reading that they distributed was uh, information given about your change in painting. You were doing a live, or working with a live nude, and your focus on what you felt with the art changed. And you talked about, they talked about, at that moment, you started to draw the picture of Christ. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that and what, what that change was like. Well, I wouldn't call it a Christophany. I'd call it a, I'd probably call it a, a moment of grace. But I was working on a painting, a, just painting a model in the studio. And it was one of the primary personal touches I think I've sensed from God over the years. When I painted that painting in a matter of minutes, this image of Christ emerged on the canvas, but I didn't know I was painting. And so I had a, a deep personal revelation at that moment that maybe God can guide the artist's hand. Now, that sounds hokey in the context of a cynical worldview that we exist in in this postmodern age. In the chapel, we've uh, invited the Reverend Ethan Akers. He's a sort of radical performance artist. But he also does faith based work. His art isn't a parody. He actually you know, has faith, but he's like the most insane performance artist you can imagine. So in a, in, in a way, you know, Thanks so, for inviting <laughs> yeah. should be a nice evening. So there is some, uh, there's a similar reference to Kincaid, and that's why we invite him here. And, uh, and he is so radical because he doesn't, you know, that he believes in something. You know, and, and uh, it, as I said before, it's just, uh, it's not the current thought in art. So, so it seems very radical. 
Uh, I'd also like to add that, in answer to your question too, uh, another subject is the subject of fate. You know, in the show we have uh, Christian art and uh, we have a chapel. And, uh, and I think that's like a, another area in a way that's been uh, taboo in art. Like, you can do art if it's ironic, you can do art, you can do all the art you want if you're making fun of people's beliefs. But if you, if, if you take their beliefs seriously, uh, you know, that's just not done in the art world. So that, that's an, another thing that we're trying to do here is we're trying to take the, the idea of faith and religion uh, very seriously. And, and I think that that's just starting to open up. I think that you'll actually see that. There's, there's a, a, a couple of shows actually happening right, that deal with that. There's a show called uh, One, 100 Artists See God. It's, uh, it's, it's being curated by uh, John Balsari and Meg Cranston that's addressing that issue. And the reason that they're addressing that is because it hasn't been addressed. It's like you can do whatever you want in art. You can take your clothes off and roll on the floor, and that's okay. But if you say that you believe in something, anything, somehow, you know, that's been thought of as wrong. I mean, you can make fun of it, but you can't believe it. So I think that's, the, that's another aspect of the show that's a little bit controversial. I believe in family, in faith, the beauty of nature, not the evidence, um, simpler ways of living, um, the dignity of neighborhood and community. Um, Old-fashioned, I never use this, the term traditional values, because they're not traditional, they're timeless. Uh, they're contemporary values as well as traditional. But they are the, the homespun foundational values of life that I affirm in my art, and all of them, as Jeffrey says, are extremely controversial within the art world. You know, if you're, if you're in the circle of success in any field, um, the, the natural inclination for the up-and-coming, and, and especially the youthful talent, is to disdain those of success. I mean, I remember this instinct so well. I mean, you know, when I was an art student, um, you know, you put down whoever was making it big, other stuff stinks. You know, I mean, that, that's the normal thing for artists. And let me also add that um, I'm in favor of any artist that would pick it um, tonight. My only request is that they would drop their portfolio off to me so that I might buy some of their paintings. Because I collect contemporary artists, I do. And I would dream that the most artists who will most vehemently uh, spit at my images and burn my catalog in effigy. I, I'll hope they'll drop their paintings by or let me see them. I might just buy one because I think the anger of young artists um, is a precious thing. And I have that anger in my heart as a young unsuccessful artist. I have a strict uh, belief though in non-censorship um, in my art and in non-sectarianism. I mean, I, or not, I should say non um, denominationalism, we might say. In other words, I believe art is for everybody. The students here at Cal State Fullerton are organizing a show that they're going to open tomorrow at 3.30 in direct response to your show. And I'm That's wondering cool. if you have any intentions of maybe going by the gallery and checking out their work. I wouldn't, ex except I'm afraid they'll stone me. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they'll be stoned. I don't know. There could be some combination. I've achieved the nirvana that Andy Warhol dreamed of achieving, um, which is the complete blending of popular and, and high culture. <laughs> Andy Warhol's dream was that he would become a robot who just could push a button and his pains would come out without him even involved. And I've done that. <laughs> I, I, so there are objects here that are Kincaid art objects that some robot created. And I wasn't there when it got created. Not my original paintings, but I mean there are there are beautiful objects in there that our licensees make, a lot of which I'm not directly involved in the creating of. That's just the nature of mass merchandising. I do the paintings, but sometimes the products that come from the paintings are beyond my control. The fact that this exhibit enshrines those in a fine art setting is brilliant. 